Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's virtual plant clinic. I'm sorry we were we got caught up discussing vegetable seeds and stuff that David's going to be talking about today. So we got started just a few seconds late. Um, today, David's going to be covering uh, what to plant now, what to plant later, and I'll let him discuss a little bit, a little bit more of what he's got in mind. But planting times now that spring is here, which is a very exciting topic, um, because I know we're all super, super happy that spring has arrived. Um, for those of you who are new to this program, we are recording these. They generally become available about 24 hours after the class on YouTube. If you have any questions during this class, you can type them into the Q&A box uh, on your Zoom menu, and I'll be watching those for David and uh, giving him questions as they come in or when he's able to take them. Uh, so I that's it on my part. <laughs> and, uh, David, I will let you dive right in. All right. Well, thanks uh, for being here, everybody, and good afternoon. So obviously the weather has been uh, absolutely crazy. And so I was getting prepared for today. Uh, I'd go back and say, well, what, what, what am I running into at the plant clinic? What kind of questions am I encountering and the issues that we're facing? And so I titled the class today, is it spring yet? Well, clearly it's spring, you know, it's uh, the first day of spring was back in March 20, you know, the, the um, vernal equinox there. The, um, the thing is, since that time, I think it was about five days ago, four days ago, we had nighttime temperatures. You know, again, here in Fairfax, I had temperatures. I woke up in the morning, temperatures as low as 35 degrees, 37 degrees, 38 degrees uh, over the weekend. And then today, they're talking about high of 90 degrees. So to say the weather has been erratic and crazy, um, absolutely a true statement. We all know that. So what I keep hearing all the time, the most common question I'm facing right now is, is, is it time to plant this? Is it time to plant that? You know, is it, can I put these plants out? You know, it's those kind of questions because the unpredictability of the weather is really kind of left us in a little bit of a quandary of how we proceed from here. Uh, so the, the short answer is, I don't know. I don't have good answers because I can't really predict the weather any better than you can. But I wanted to share where some of the data comes from that we use in making our discussion, our decisions. So we're going to talk about frost dates, uh, hardiness zones, heat zones, um, soil temperatures, where you can find that data, how we kind of piece all this stuff together, and then ultimately to sort of flip the coin and make our choice and what to plant and what not to plant. So it's a little bit of a different sort of topic. I had a lot of fun pulling all this together. I've learned a lot in the process of, of doing these sessions. Hope you do as well. And of course, I believe I think I only have like eight pictures today. So I tried not to put too much content in here so we'd have time for lots of questions because uh, I'm sure you will have plenty of questions out there. So with that as a little bit of an intro, I'm just going to go ahead and kick this thing off. And again, where you have questions, uh, please send those to Sally, and she forwards those on to me. So um, first thing I want to talk about really is what we call our last frost dates. Um, you can see I put a reference up here, this um, garden.org. That's a terrific resource where you can just go online, you can put your zip code number up, and then they give you recommendations what our average frost date is. Because a lot of things, if we're talking about annuals, uh, which is where I'm starting our conversation, there's a lot of plants that we can put out that will withstand cold temperatures. There are some that cannot. So we're always trying to predict the weather and figure out, okay, just when is it safe for me to start putting tender plants out there? So the way this chart works uh, is we have really two critical numbers here. 36 degrees is considered a frost date and 32 degrees would be considered a freeze date. So we're talking about last frost or last freeze. So if I look at this, what's, what's today? April, I should know the date, April 12th, I think it is, or something like that. Uh, that's what happens when you work around the clock. One day runs into the next. But we go down this chart and we look and say, okay, on the last freeze date, the last 32 degrees, well, 
if it's March 30th, we know that we have a 90% chance of freezing temperatures. On April 3rd, we have an 80% chance. You know, on April 6th, 70% chance we march our way down here. And so when we get to this April 10, April 12, we are now at a point where, hey, they, we could still have a freeze. It is possible. Of, you know, they say that April 12 is of an average of when we have frost. So again, these aren't really extremes. This is an average, and to the best of my understanding, this is data that's pulled over about the past 10 years. Uh, and we're not really free of that until we get down here to about April 22nd. So I, I look at those dates, but then I also look at our weather forecast just on my, my phone app, and hey, I'm looking out the ten, next 10 days and all the temperatures are staying you know, pretty much 50 and above, even nighttime temperatures, maybe dropping down into the upper 40s sometimes, but it doesn't appear to be any real chance of a freeze from this point on. Oh, we look at this 36 degrees, which is you can still get a frost, um, even though it doesn't reach freezing temperatures. And again, on you know, if I look at this and say, hey, April 12th, they're saying, well, there's still like this 90% chance that we could get a frost this early in the day. We're not really free of that risk until we get pretty much in the May. So a light frost is still possible. But again, I'd look in the forecast, you know, you project out for at least the next 10 days. We don't see that. So that's that's helpful information. So when we're trying to figure out, you know, what to plant, what not to plant, what kind of risks are involved right now, this is just a real tricky time of year uh, because, again, we still have that possibility of some cool nights ahead. Uh, but yet our forecast and everything has been the last couple months, you know, have shown, you know, pretty warm conditions. So literally for three weeks now we've had people asking for tomatoes but we've always just said no no it's too early but we have tons of stuff in the annuals that can safely be put outdoors because there are plants like i put in the pictures here you know petunias the million bell snapdragons these are cool weather plants cool season plants uh, we can put them out there and even if we were to get a frost these plants would just still be fine they would be very happy while there's some other plants uh, that we'll talk about things like coleus or tomatoes or something like that that may not be so happy so again it's it's a combination of what the weather is going to do we look at historical records also knowing your plants what they are um, to go in so essentially my advice is we are like loaded up inventory is full stuff looks beautiful buy it um, but either you need to really know what you're putting out there and do some homework on your frost dates and weather, or always talk with us because um, we keep an eye on this and use our plant knowledge and everything, and we'll help you try and make good decisions on there. Um, and we always say, of course, gardening is very local, so this depends where you are. So what I've been using, I punched in the, uh, oh, I got the wrong code there. It should be 22030, but uh, this is roughly the Maryfield Garden Center. I'm actually located, oh, just south of where that dot is or pretty close to it. I'm off by a couple of digits in the zip code. But I also like to look at what the soil temperatures are because soil temperatures also have a big influence on what's going in. So if we have warm season plants, things like, you know, tomatoes I mentioned, basil that I mentioned, they really want to hit the ground in warm soil and they want to hit that um, running. So this is um, where you can actually check the soil temperatures online. Um, There's greencastonline.com. And I've been using this um, website for probably four or five years now. A customer shared it with me and I've been doing it. I found it to be pretty reliable and you'll watch these temperatures go up and down a lot of it based on the amount of sunlight you get, you know, on a nice clear day like this where there's no clouds, uh, that temperature can get pretty high. You have some cloud cover and you'll see pretty dramatic change in there. So that's just the, so the sun gradually warming the soil. So if I have plants that really like warm soils, I look at it and I'm paying more attention to what the five day average is. So on any given day, like we're talking about our daytime highs could be as much as 90 degrees today. Uh, out here in the full sun, when I took this at 11.15 and put it on here, uh, our, 
our soil temperature at 73 degrees has probably gone up a few degrees since that time. But I'm really not interested in what's happening that day, so I'm going to look at at least a five-day average. Another little thing I'll say that I was just found this was interesting when I was looking at this, preparing for today's show. Right now, uh, our soil temperature is running, I think, about six degrees warmer than what our typical uh, five-year average would be, because that data is in there. They also have a soil moisture map uh, that I looked at, and we're right now running about 6% lower than our average. So I'm just thinking right now, hey, that combination of above average soil temperatures, below average um, soil moisture content, that's that take that as a warning sign of, I was out doing a little bit of watering on some, some recently planted stuff here this morning, and it's also kind of a warning to you to go around and check, make sure what's going on in your garden, that you're not neglecting uh, the watering on something. So our soil temperatures, become really important in terms of like seed starting and what bulbs we're gonna plant. Um, examples for that might be that right now, if I'm looking over here, I'm saying, okay, hey, cool season vegetables, um, things like I see radicchio down here, beets down here, you know, soil temperatures are absolutely fine for that. But if I start looking at peppers and pumpkins and uh, cucumbers and stuff, our soil temperatures are a little bit below optimum uh, for those plants. So that's something that's like, well, I could plant now. This is awfully early in the season. The soil temperature is not there. There's still this slight risk of a uh, frost that's out there. So some of that stuff I would probably be holding off on. When we look at things like these bulbs, um, you know, even plants like dahlia tubers and everything, you know, they like to go into a nice warm soil. We're not quite there yet. Uh, I'm not saying you can't plant it right now, but we're just not quite there. Another option we always have available to us is if, if you're growing in pots, if you're growing containers, those are elevated up out of the ground, so they're exposed on all sides, and so your temperatures tend to be a little bit warmer in that environment. Uh, I would also kind of say that, uh, sorry, I forgot this, that we have this situation of microclimates, uh, which always factors into it. I probably shared where my house is on a faces north. Uh, it's shaded by some trees in the front. So I can literally be almost two weeks behind my neighbor that's literally just 50, 60 feet away across the street, but they're facing in a southern exposure. But we will have the same plants and my will be blooming about two weeks later than the ones that are back there. So just some more examples that are in here. Uh, if I look at something like, and, and this is where I say we kind of go plant by plant. Oh, good, you can see it. Like the geraniums, the pelargoniums we see. This is a plant that um, actually does quite well in slightly cooler temperatures. We've been selling these for about the last two weeks. Um, they would be thriving in a situation like, uh, like we're having right now. The only thing is I'm watching the weather forecast. So last weekend when we were down in 34, 35, 36 degrees, our nighttime temperatures, I would keep that in the pot and so I could bring it indoors um, into the pot. So that would be something that actually likes cooler temperatures. Whereas if I had a sunflower like this one, this is a plant that just loves the warmth, loves the heat. Um, if I had in a pot or container like it is here, I'd say just keep it in the pot, buy it, get it, keep it in the pot in the container right now for now, but you're watching your forecast. I wouldn't, if I was going to plant it in the ground, I'd probably be holding off at least another, you know, seven or 10 days, kind of keep an eye on the weather forecast before I considered putting it in the ground. There are some, like when we talked about bulbs, things like lilies, peonies, you know, these are definitely cold hardy plants. Um, they can go straight into the ground right away, whereas I might look at something that's a tropical plant, and I have here the uh, Elfineers calicacia. This is something that likes warm soils, uh, so if I was in a pot or container, yes, but also keeping an eye on it for any risk of frost that comes out there. Things like uh, the, the coleus is one that if we were to get cold, we got to watch that, so I'm not going to put it in the ground. Uh, I'm kind of rambling on here, but also things like this, the, I call it the blue-eyed daisy or African daisy, thrives in cool temperatures. Fuchsia thrives. I've already planted fuchsia out in my yard. So 
kind of complicating it, but it's a plant by plant by plant sort of decision. Also looking at weather, knowing your microclimate, you do all this stuff and you kind of make your best guess. So it's it's challenging time of year, but it's a fun time of year. Uh, so I, I've got more to talk about, but right now, do I have any questions that might pertain to like the annuals, the vegetables, uh, any of this tender stuff? Yes, you do. And we did have a question come in about um, when to plant azaleas and arborvitaes. So I don't know if you're going to get into any of that. Um, but after that, I'll jump, I'll jump into herbs now. So um, the first question is about, actually, we have a couple questions about herbs. Um, Lisa says, I grew parsley, oregano, and basil seedlings indoors. When can they be planted outside? So those are all great examples of those questions. So one thing is, let me say, Trees and shrubs, they're, they're rock solid, they're hardy. So things like the arborvitae, and I, I couldn't remember the other, but it, Ilya was the other. Ilya. just plant yeah. them. Don't, don't even worry. Don't think about it. Just plant them. Perennials, pretty rock solid. Uh, if you see something you like, plant it. Uh, like I said, that's so, I didn't really include those in there. So you get the green light on that. But great question. So like cilantro and parsley are cool weather plants they will withstand freezing temperatures. Um, so in that case, I have no hesitation of, of going ahead and putting them out there. Now there's a little bit of an acclimation process because if you've been growing them indoors, they're not quite ready to just suddenly land themselves outside. It'd be like if I just jump down there and visit Sally and lie out on the beach, I'm not acclimated for that and I'm gonna get sunburned, right? So. Yep. Dude, don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I'm while the weather is suitable for things like parsley and cilantro, uh, I'm just going to say kind of acclimate them a little bit, but the, they thrive in cold temperature. Those are two plants that get stressed out in the hot weather. Now, she said, was oregano the other one? Uh, oregano and basil. So, oregano is a perennial for us, it is winter hardy and grows through the winter. So, again, you could start moving that outside anytime now. But basil is very sensitive to cold temperatures. So basil would be one that I would be definitely sort of, you can put it outside on nice days, but if we're seeing temperatures that are going below 50 degrees, then I think on those evenings, you need to bring it back inside. And I would not actually plant that in the ground, again, probably until at least another seven or 10 days, oftentimes, Normally, I don't put those things out until we get into May, but this year, I think we really are. We've, we've seen it. it was warm in January, warm in February. It's a little bit of cold weather in March, but I, I think we're moving ahead pretty fast paced this year. Okay. Um, next question. I'm going to just jump because I think this one's pretty quick. Is, is it safe to plant lettuce seeds directly in the soil now? Yes. Yes. If the lettuce is, right? At yes. this point. Yeah, absolutely. It is just a little kind of giving you an example of how this works. And, and you, you might have to look this information up or, or in a catalog or you, most people don't even, they just know from experience to go with it. But I thought it was interesting. Uh, so they'll say the optimum soil temperature, again, not air temperature, but the optimum soil temperature is about 40 to 80 degrees for lettuce anywhere in that zone. And the optimum would be right at about 75 degrees. So what would, what did my soil temperature map say? It said something like 72 degrees or something. So if you plant lettuce right now, boom, that stuff should germinate and come right out. So you can find sometimes in the vegetable seed catalogs, I'll have these germination, soil temperature germinations, but you can really make this stuff work to your advantage if, if you do the homework on it. Yeah, um, that actually leads well into the next question, which is kind of what you and I were talking about before we started the live stream. Um, what soil temperature is needed for tomatoes and cucumbers? So tomatoes and cucumbers, again, they, they'll, they'll germinate in a range of temperatures and specifically, because I got right here, my little cheat sheet. So if I say cucumbers, for example, tomatoes would be right in there. They'll germinate in soil temperatures anywhere from 60 to 95 degrees, but you get your ideal germination rates, um, actually closer to that, um, about 80 degrees. So, or yeah, 85, I was reading the wrong line there. So basically, uh, yes, you could start them now. This is uh, in that range where they should germinate and do well, but we still haven't even warmed up to their maximum ideal soil temperature range. So uh, 
So yeah, you could certainly, the question is about direct sowing out there. I have, I think you could do it now, but this is probably about the earliest that I would, you know, either now or even hold off for another week or 10 days. Okay. Um, all better. right, now we'll talk about some flowers. The next question is, when is a good time to plant vinca? Say vinca? Yeah. Uh, again, that's that's a plant that's pretty sensitive to cold temperatures. So, for example, this is what some people get aggravated with. We all got spring fever. We all want to go. We want to plant. And I don't think we even have vinca in stock yet. But we're we're doing this really to, to protect your interest. We've kind of held back on bringing some stuff in. This is the first week that we really pulled the trigger and got some of these warmer soil plants in. By next weekend, we're going to be like, fully loaded so so you're in that you're kind of in that that area where you're still a slight slight risky again if you see it you better get it um but before you actually permanently put it in the ground i i might hold off a little bit is there any difference because we had a question that just came in from facebook if you're planting tomatoes like on a deck in a container is there any difference in the timing that you would plant them if you're planting them in ground versus in a container so, so your soil temperatures will be warmer in a pot in a container. So that's a good thing. You might actually see the plants grow faster and take off quicker, but you still have to be um, aware of the nighttime lows, you know, about any risk of frost or, or freezing in there. When we actually had a question about that. So if you, if you have your tomatoes or your lettuce or whatever in the ground and you realize there's going to be a frost, what what do you do about that? What are the products you can use? I know Peg shows her um, frost blanket frequently. Right. Is that something that you would recommend for, for plants at this point in the year? Yeah, it's not meant to bring that in for show and tell, but when I'm a frost blanket or frost cloth, it's synthetic material. It's very, very lightweight, almost like tissue paper, so it doesn't crush the plants, but it can give you about two degrees of insulation against cold weather. So frost cloth is hands down, really, to me, the very best way to do that. Uh, if you don't, and if the plants are small, sometimes I've used even trash cans or something turned upside down, to create kind of like a little tent, a little shelter for it overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, we really don't like using plastic bags because they don't breathe, they don't ventilate. But as an absolute last desperate, like, you know, you're not prepared, you know, putting a putting a plastic bag over might be in a, a a possibility, but you also want to make sure that you pull that off the next morning because yeah. they can trap heat under there. So it's not a great idea, but if you're desperation, you might go that way. We had a lot of that in Florida at Christmas when we had that huge freeze for a couple of weeks. I think you all had the same really abnormally cold weather, but there were a lot of um, bed sheets and plastic bags and just whatever people had wrapped around things so right now i've got frost blankets that i've had for easily five years or more i mean if you take care yeah. of them they'll last so again i if, if as you get more experience and build up your inventory frost cloth is definitely the preferred Way better yeah that's i wish i had had them at christmas um okay let's see here next question Ooh, okay a perennial when is the best time to plant ostrich fern can that be planted now or is that? Um, they could totally be planted now. I've, I've been shopping for that. We don't have any in stock yet. I've been going out there two, three times a week looking for it, um, waiting for that to show up in stock. But I, if I had one, I would not hesitate to plant it. Okay. Okay. Again, um, the perennials, they're cold hardy. That, that's not a, not really a problem. Not an issue. Okay. How about, how about rosemary? Uh, rosemary. So rosemary, I would certainly go ahead and plant it now. They can get killed or damaged under very cold temperatures, but I'm talking about things like down in 20, 25 degrees, um, you know, that, that can kill them out. But I really think those days are, are hopefully past. So I'm laughing. We just got a comment from Elsie asked about the ostrich fern and Lynn has replied back and says, I can give you 100 ostrich ferns. <laughs> Someone has a lot of ostrich ferns at their house. Um, yeah, I might have been mixed up on that. I was thinking I've been looking for the cinnamon fern. I, I that's the one I was. Thinking. I know. I've. I know. I think cinnamon fern and ostrich fern are two that Peg really likes. I know she has a lot of. I think both of them. I think. Um, oh, here's okay. Could I put my poinsettia outside? Ooh, I would be cautious on that. Again, poinsettias really don't want to see temperatures you know below fifty degrees of. Uh, so again, this kind of thing, you could put it outside during nice weather, but you keep an eye on the weather forecast 
especially keep them out, check your nighttime lows, um, and you have to be ready to bring it back indoors or at least an unheated garage or something like that when you see those temperatures going at 50 or below. Okay, okay. Um, let's see here. All right, I just want to let everybody know I'm trying to stick to the planting times questions and we'll get to other plant clinic questions if yeah. we have time. And I do have more, more pictures, so I, I'm not... You okay. Know, take a couple more, but then let me talk about some other weather things. Okay. Um, we'll we'll stop with this one for now. This is the last one that I'll ask you at the moment because it's the last like planting question. What about hanging baskets with flowers? What types of flowers would be okay to leave out in hanging baskets at this point? I just go pick one up from the garden store that from from the from the store that's available now. <laughs> that would be my lazy way. So uh, again, you like we've got you know. Um, yeah. You know, we have things like fuchsia, petunias, the million yeah. bells, even the um, the ivy geraniums. You know, these are all good choices. Uh, I'm thinking, think uh, lobelia. You know, there's a lot of good stuff that's out there. Now, these plants, again, should we get actually where we get into a frost or a freeze warning, they they might need to come indoors. But I think that's unlikely at this point. You know, I would certainly give you on the green light on that. Go for it. I'm um, I'm a little um, a little bit less confident in some of the begonias because uh, like we've got really nice begonia baskets in, uh, but if if I saw again temperatures going anywhere close to to frost or freezing, you you might need to bring it in. So uh, again, it just look at those, check those sites, check your frost dates, um, look around. I, mo most of this stuff I'm saying you've got a green light, go for it but watch your weather forecast. And if we yeah. see temperatures that are going much below 50, if we're going down into the 40s, or definitely if we're going down into the 30s, get, get ready to cover some of the sensitive things. Oh man, yeah, I, lo I love the fuchsia hanging baskets. Um, okay, we had one more question come in about if it's okay. Okay, I'm not sure, I may be wrong about this, but Vinca Minor Bowls, B-O-W-L-E-S, it's purple. Is that back in stock yet? Is that the same? Are th there two kinds of Vinca? <laughs> like uh, there's a we sell about three different kinds of Vinca. Never, okay, yeah, that's like I know. I'm pretty sure there's like a perennial Vinca, so I wanted to make sure. Yeah, the Vinca, that that particular variety, I don't know the inventory uh, okay. that well. You just have to call the store to check on that one. Okay, uh, just thinking like the annual Vinca with our earlier call. Not, the annual Vinca is not in yet. We don't. You'd have to call the store to check on the perennial. Right, but the the other the the Vinca Minor uh, that should be pretty widely available. I just that particular variety, I don't know. Yeah. Not sure about. Okay, um, we can we can stop there and move on to some other questions because we've covered all of the questions that are like specifically about planting times. Good, because I want to talk a little bit again about uh, this is all about the weather. But we were talking a little bit about you know freeze fr freeze and frost temperatures, soil temperatures. Uh, another thing that we look at a lot as far as just data and trying to make decisions on plant selection is on our hardiness zones. Uh, so what they're doing here, this is again um, managed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but they track the records. And then based on the historic low temperatures, they give us a temperature range of sort of the, the coldest we should expect during winter. So again, this little, this little dot right here, that's where I'm sitting right now. This is Maryfield Garden Center. Uh, Again, you can do this by zip code. You just go on the internet. You know, you put, this is where I am. Put the uh, zip code in here. And what that translates over to, I go kind of color coded and say, okay, so I'm right here in zone 7A. Uh, so the further south we go, this kind of more olive green color would be 7B. And then if I look up here, more towards Sterling, Ashburn area, there I'm actually sort of a 6B. So these different zones, these different color zones are what the average low temperature would be in, in these areas. Now, what they're, where this data comes from is they look at the past 30 years. Um, and so they'll do a regular review on this that goes and they look at what the temperature have been over the past 30 years. And these zones move and change over time. So the data that they just last looked at, we're operating off of data, I think was, um, yeah, from 1976 to 2005. 
So these zones were revised in 2005. Uh, they've been looked at again, but they haven't moved enough to, to produce a new map. But most of Fairfax County um, went from being in zone six to being in zone seven. So this does reflect kind of the gradual warming that we encounter in the area. And it does reflect the type of plants that we might choose. So there are what I call plants that were traditionally not winter hardy in our zone, uh, which are now becoming parts of our landscape. So a couple of examples of this, these are what I call zone seven plants. They're, they're if you go further south, you know, again, if you're down in Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, um, these plants have been rock solid, sturdy, hardy down there. But as the temperatures warm, uh, these plants are now coming up and we've been using these and bringing them in and trying and offering them in our garden centers. But I always say they come sort of with qualifications, that qualification being that we're really at the northernmost limit for these. So a couple examples like um, the Elysium, and there's a couple different species here. This is growing in popularity. You can't see it really well, but this is a really cool little uh, or flower showing up on here in the green leaf form. Uh, the yellow one, I think that's uh, the Elysium floridum, has grown for the, the bright yellow foliage on it. Um, Mahonia, soft caress. We know Mahonia, but this is a very low, bushy type. has very much of a fern-like look at it. Uh, but you really have to know your microclimate in this case, because as I said, they these are plants that five years ago, 10 years ago, certainly, we didn't even offer them for sale. They were just not reliably winter hardy in our climate. But as the, the weather has gotten warmer, the climate's gotten warmer, uh, some of these plants are now coming up and we're having some relatively good success with them. But again, I always say with qualifications because your microclimate matters a lot. Um, if they are in a very open, exposed area where the cold, drying winter winds are going to blow through them, um, they're going to get beat up. And I see a lot of these plants coming into the clinic now. And I'm trying to explain to people, hey, they're just beat up from winter. They're going through the recovery phase. And so a lot of times they'll, they'll get, you'll get browning, shedding, leaf drop. Um, and then it's not until we get into about June that they start really looking great again. But with careful siding, you know, maybe up against a you know, south facing wall where they're sheltered, protected, maybe even take the steps of putting a little frost clover over them, um, that can help prevent some of this um, damage from occurring. But it's kind of neat that we have plants now that uh, we just didn't even have before. Uh, along with this, in this greenery in the background, you can't see this. This is what I call hardy gardenia. Uh, these are rated at zone seven. Uh, again, so like if you were further out, if you're in that Ashburn, uh, Leesburg area, this is probably a no-go for you. But if you're uh, closer in, certainly if you're like down in Alexandria, Mount Vernon, you know, you could have very good success on these. Uh, so these, these um, gardenias, Again, everybody loves them because, hey, I got, they're evergreen. They got beautiful flowers. They're wonderfully fragrant. But their ability to come through the winter is going to depend a lot on your microclimate, exactly how you site them. And I see times where they get hit kind of hard in the winter. And what happened to us this year, right, if you go back in, in Thanksgiving to Christmas time period, it was pretty cold. We got us down to like seven degree temperatures right around Christmas time. So they would have been pretty much hammered when it was seven degrees. Then January and February, you know, it was like we even went up to 80 degrees at, at one point in time. So, but we had enough cold weather um, in that time. These plants would have been injured, not outright killed, but injured. Um, Fatsia, which we've been offering as a, uh, really as a house plant, uh, is actually it's like a zone eight plant but even I go back I, I had a maintenance customer I'm going back like 35 years ago that was in northwest Washington DC had this little microclimate up there it was sit we actually had fascia that was living you know year to year surviving through the winter in this one client's garden so these things we have them in the, the landscape they're available to you expands your palate that's out there but I always kind of offer these kind of say with qualifications that have to be cited just right 
or maybe even go to the consideration of taking um, a little precaution. So along that's the same kind of a school of thought or line of conversation, this is much less known, it's less popular, but the American Horticulture, American Horticulture Society, AHS there decided, well, so that's talking about low temperatures, what about high temperatures? Because there are plants that thrive in the cool weather and it's our high heat and humidity in summer that stresses them out. So they created a heat zone map. And again, giving you a little bit of reference, I'm looking here saying, okay, um, right here is George Mason University, Fairfax area. So we're right bordering again, this kind of zone six, seven, and they talk about the, the days above 86 degrees that we have. So examples of this might be, if you look at the Canadian hemlock, Colorado blue spruce, we are pushing the southernmost limit on their heat tolerance. So these are plants that thrive in cool weather, um, but as we migrate further south, uh, they become more and more marginal, more and more stressed in their environment. So things like uh, Canadian hemlock, which is, is actually native in, along the mountainous regions, but you know that was back again, that's a Northern species, you know, during glaciation and ice age, you know, a lot of these things like red spruce, hemlock, got pushed back into here as those, you know, ice ages and glaciers retreated. These were left behind as just we call relics in the woods. And now we're facing exact opposite situation where these, as our weather gets warmer, these plants are becoming more and more stressed. So these zones, I was reading a very interesting article, if, if, this, if this heat zone, if it's moving north, or I mean, the, the not the heat zone, but the, the frost, the cold zone is moving north. This one, if it's the hardiness zones, where I was like, where if it's moving north at a rate of about uh, 13 miles each decade is what it is, uh, we're seeing these gradual things warm up and we're gonna start to see some of our Northern species retreat while we're seeing some of our Southern species um, move in. So. That's, um, I just want to share all that kind of stuff. It's the interesting times we live in to see how the weather's changing, what that's doing to affect our plant selection. It's happening right now, right in front of our eyes. Um, and we just got, I don't have an answer for you. I'm just saying it's, we're, we're going to just watch it and kind of try to keep reacting to it. I don't even try to make predictions. Let's see if we have any more questions, Sally. We do. Everybody, please feel free to send in any more questions you have. I'm going to start with the ones we've got now. Um, and then if any questions come in about planting times, then we'll we'll pivot to those. Um, David, the first question is, we've got a couple that are not planting related now. We'll go ahead and get to. Um, the Is there an ideal date for treating the wiggly, wiggly is in quotes, azalea scale bugs in mid-June? Should we move that date up due to warmer than usual temperatures? If you've got scale on your azalea. Ooh, so that, that brings in a whole thing I, I, I decided not to talk about today. <laughs> there's, there's, um, there's another set of data, if you really want to get into this, it's called degree days. And what uh, professionals will do is they're taking the daytime averages. They'll take the high, the low, um, divide that in half, they've got these equations and, and they'll actually watch how those degree days, how those temperatures accumulate up and down. So it accounts for these big ups and downs in our weather temperatures. And based on that, they can actually, we actually know when certain pests are going to emerge. What I have been seeing is I think everything is going to be emerging early this year. Uh, so I don't have an exact thing on, on it. But if you said, uh, and, and I'm this off the top of my head, so check these, but like if you said the recommended treatment dates were um, June 1 to June 10, I think we're going to discover that those hatch out earlier and that magic date might turn out to be something like, you know, May 25th to, to June 5. So I think those dates will change based on what our weather's doing. Uh, so so just keep an eye out, you know, keep exam, check during those dates, but things might start happening even, uh, you know, five, 10 days earlier would not surprise me. Interesting. All right. Um, gardening is truly an art <laughs> and a science. Yeah. Uh, next question. Um, 
This is from Tina. Do you think that she can remove the frost cloth off of her hydrangea now that she had covered before Christmas? Yes. So I pulled, I took mine off uh, two days ago, I think it was my way into work. We had had our last cold night. I pulled that blanket off of it. But you know what? I didn't like put away in storage. I just put it on my porch as a just in case. But I, I'm going to say yes, uh, but a qualified yes. Don't, don't put it away for the winter. Just put it away, but where you can easily reach it if you need to. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, next question is from Facebook. Can you split hostas after they've started leafing out? Yes, you can. Uh, that's actually a pretty good time. Now, I want to catch as early as possible. But like in the winter, you don't know where they are. You can't remember where you plant and where they're coming up exactly. But I know at least in, again, I'm, I'm, my garden runs late because I'm in the shade, but hosts are only only about this tall in my garden. So right now I'm like, oh, there you are. They're just starting to come up uh, so you can see them. Uh, they are such hardy plants. They divide so easily. I would do it soon as possible, um, but I would certainly have no hesitation about going for it. Okay, okay. Um, all right, next question. Oh man, we have all kinds. This is like fun. This is just like a like a smorgasbord of questions and topics. Um, my sugar snap peas never produce many peas. Do you have any planting or growing tips? Oh, uh, giving up growing. Peas. What? <laughs> That's not a good answer. I just quit, you know, when something's too difficult. Oh, you gave up on peas, growing peas? Well, so, so they really like a long, cool growing season. And this year is a good example. Like oftentimes our spring, we just don't, you know, it's like we're cruising along and then we jump in the spring. Now I had people believe that this year we're planting peas back in January and February because, you know, we were having 50, 60 degree weather. And we said, well, let's go for it. Um, they might have success. What I did, this is just sharing ideas. Um, but what I ended up doing is I've always had better success with uh the the snow peas so i kind of just said i'm not i just give up on like english peas snap peas move to uh snow peas and that that was my easy answer but yeah when you when you see 90 degrees and it's the middle of april uh that's yeah. that's not going to be good for growing things like peas and broccoli and yeah. season plants I was looking down here at some of the peas, like black eyed peas and like lady peas, some of the worms ones we grow down in Florida. Um, I'm not sure I'm brave enough to try it. All right, let's see. Uh, next question. Can we put in Asclepius, Coreopsis, and Bee Balm now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, those again. Perennials, I'm not concerned about. They, they're pretty rock solid. Uh, if we get a frost, you might get a little browning on the leaves or the flowers, but certainly nothing is going to be beyond just mild injury. Okay. Um, okay, so this person has geraniums and plumeria, some plants that are in their house. Is it okay for them to start bringing them out or should they wait a while? How does that transition work? Uh, again, this is a little a little bit of a qualified yes. Uh, two things, just like we'd mentioned, when you're taking a plants outside, they have been kind of, their acclimated indoor life, so wind, can really beat them up. You know, full direct hot sun on a day like this can give them sunburn. So I think it's best if you kind of acclimate them, put them in an area that's a little bit sheltered and buffered from direct hot sun and very exposed winds until they've had several days to get sort of acclimated. Uh, I think on the, what again, on the immediate, like when I'm looking at that 10 day forecast, uh, it looks pretty good right now, but Go ahead, move them out there, but keep an eye on it. You know, check your weather every day. Uh, if I see temperatures that are dipping below 50 degrees, the plumeria particularly, uh, you might want to bring back inside. So you have to be ready to adjust a little bit with the weather forecast. Okay. Um, all right, next question. This is from Brenda. I've started putting my plants in big barrels and the peas are shooting up. My lettuce, spinach, and radishes are going crazy. Any advice on this first time trying as I'm 73 years old? That's awesome. Welcome to vegetable gardening. Exactly. <laughs> never, never too late to get started. Uh, it sounds like you're doing really well. Like we were talking about peas earlier. The fact that you got an early start is, is in your favor. Now, those are all kind of cool season vegetables so when the day like this at 90 degrees that's they're not really 
happy at that. I mean, you they will grow certainly, but sometimes it leads to where the the radishes get a little bit kind of hot and spicy, and the the lettuce can get bitter. The peas may not reach full maturity. So, depending on what's available to you, in cases like that, I'm not opposed to like if you can put an umbrella, like a sunbrella, you know, something, put a little bit of shade on, try to keep a little bit of heat off of it is good. Because what they really want is a long, cool season that's staying 50, 60, 70 degrees. When we start going 80, 90, that's kind of less than ideal for them. It's still going to work for you. Um, so so I'm not, it's fantastic and and I'd want to be encouraging. But if you, had, if you had some clever way of throwing a little shade on them in the heat of the day, uh, you'll probably do even better. Okay. Yeah. She said she's put her lettuce in the shade more. Good information. Um, okay. Let's see here. Okay. We have three questions on fertilizer, all focusing on different types of plants. So okay. <laughs> this, I'm just going to kind of combine them all. So the first question is from Facebook. Um, Ricky says, I'm at a bit of a loss to figure out what kind of fertilizer to use and when for various plantings. So um, Ricky's focused on landscape shrubs, azalea, belia, camellia, skip laurels. Um, the next question is, when is a good time to give plant feed to our fruit trees and pomegranates, figs, and plum? And the last question is, should I use compost or an organic granular fertilizer for lettuce, peas, and kale? So we have <laughs> fertilizers for landscape shrubs, fruit trees, and vegetables. Yes. Yeah, so, so for all of those plants, I think this is a good time to do that. Uh, I actually like to wait until I start to see those buds swell and the first signs of growth coming on. All that is here because I always say fertilizers like giving them a vitamin pill. So as opposed to fertilizing a plant while it's still dormant in a resting state, I like to see that actually some growth is occurring. And so they can photosynthesize, you know, they're transpiring, they're actively growing, and they can utilize those nutrients to their best ability. So on the timing, whether it's trees, shrubs, vegetables, you know, all that's happening now, it's a good time to do that. As far as what you choose, whether you do a uh, conventional fertilizer or you do an organic fertilizer, I kind of leave that choice up to you. I feel like it's very much like going grocery shopping where I would, I might want to go buy all organic produce, but it's also got to fit within my, my budget kind of thing. And, uh, and I got to be willing to put up with little nuisance things like, you know, what most of them tend to have a little bit of an odor to it, but there's a lot of advantages they might offer. So to me, that's kind of which one you choose, which route you go to. That's, that's really just judgment call of when you come into the garden center. And that's why it's sometimes hard to give simple answers. We can help you make that choice, whether you, you know, if you really want to tailor and go with something more specific or all purpose on there of, because all those plants, whether it's fruit trees, you know, ornamentals or vegetables, I might give you a little bit of an answer. So my bias is on the fruit trees and the vegetables. I'd probably be giving you organic for the fruit trees. It would probably be something like um, what I'm trying to think. It's called tree tone. Should be over a minute. For the vegetables, Espoma makes one that's called garden tone. Those are organic options on the trees and shrubs that are ornamental. I might just go with something like uh you know, tree and shrub food, which is just a conventional, typical fertilizer. But yeah, this is a good time for all of that. Okay. All right. We've had a few more questions come in. I know we're running over, but maybe we can take a couple more. Um, sure. We'll have to call, have to call it at some point. But thank you guys. I love this. It's fun having all these different topics. Um, my radishes have leaves, but the root is spindly. What could be wrong? So that's what happens if you're trying to grow radishes under warm temperatures. Uh, okay. is the thing that's back to where I say we're we're blessed that we have you know the four seasons here um in this area but we also they go they come and go quickly so that's that's the trick trying to work within it and you just have to accept that you'll learn that as you get more experience in gardening some years just go better than others um, but this this temperature we're having now of you know you know, 85, 90 degrees in April is not really doing us favors on root crops and uh, and some of the greens and cold crops. So, yeah. All right. I roll yeah. with it, maybe try to throw a little shade over to keep things cool, but that's that, other than that, we're at the mercy of the weather. When would you start planting radish? Would that have been, when do we get, like early March? 
Uh, yeah, I was going to say a month ago, normally I would start those even in March, but this year with the crazy weather we've had, you could have started that in January or February. Yeah. But that's hindsight. That's that's what drives you crazy. It's always hindsight. So we look at these different records, this data, but their averages and each yeah. year, each day is different. Yeah, you just never, it's part of the game. You never quite know what weather you're going to get. But we get into this, and I try not to complicate it. I really don't, but it's but it it can go. That's why I was giving you like these soil temperature data, frost dates. If you people are really into this, they'll they'll start tracking their soil temperatures and then make a decision um, and choose their planting dates based on that more so than the calendar. Okay. Okay. All right. We've got a couple of lawn care questions. Um, so David. If you want to take those, or if you have time, we can take those, or I can refer them to your recent uh, plant clinic on lawn care that we did. Um, it's about oh, let's, let's take them. I know I'm usually very strict about staying on time, but, but right. <laughs> if we've got, if you're good, we've got time. We can stay on. And anybody who has to go, that's fine. We're I've got time, but I'm big on starting on time and being okay. punctual. But yes, we'll, we we'll make, make an exception today. You're on break. Gets to take their break as planned and then not miss, not miss anything. Um, okay. Next question then, is it time to patch bald spots in the lawn? Uh, kind of a yes and no answer on that. Like, like things for, for like back to my, what we're talking about today, soil temperatures are absolutely perfect ideal for germinating of grass seed right now. If you put it down, you keep it watered, that grass could be up quickly, like even five, six, seven days right now. So from that perspective, the answer is yes, very good conditions. The rest of the story is though, as we start moving into June and July and we start hitting 85, 95 degrees, that may determine how successful you are or not. So you'll get off to a good strong start, but how you do through summer is gonna depend on the weather. Okay, um, and the next one, question is when do you put down treatment for grub control uh, again that typically waits until around may time period but with the warm weather i think it might be earlier it might be earlier again because I, I keep saying our our temperature soil temperatures at least here are running about six seven degrees above average so let's give that maybe another week because uh, we we're probably real close to that okay Okay. Again, we're making predictions based on on what we've seen in the past and so on. Okay. Yeah, we're we're approaching that window. This is the last question for you. Um, I'm trying to plant an English type garden in an area that's frequented by deer. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. One more long question. I'm going to ask you real quick. Is there still time to apply the fertilizer and the weed preventer, or have we left that window? Is it too late? No, it's not too late. Now, I've uh, I've seen some of these summer weeds have already started. I had customer bring in samples of Japanese stilt grass yesterday. Um, that's the first I've seen of it. Okay. So I would say you want to act on that as soon as possible uh, yeah. because yeah. We're, we're in that window where stuff is, some of it's already started sprouting, but that might be just the first 5%. If you're able to act on it now, we maybe can catch the other 95% before it takes off. Okay. Um, all right. On to the last question. Um, oh, and for the- Valerie, This is the third or fourth time you said last I'm question. Like, I'm like my soccer coach when I was in high school. Last one and like one more. Yeah. Just um, one more lap, right? <laughs> one person on Facebook just asked if it's too late to plant azaleas and the answer is no. That no, no, no. It's perfect time. They're starting to bloom so you can come in, pick out the colors you want. This is ideal. Yeah, now it's great. Uh, okay, not last. This is really, truly the last question, guys. I'm sorry, but we have to cut it off here. I can't. <laughs> I got it. Got it. I can't be my soccer coach for too long. Um, Try to plant an English type garden in an area frequented by deer. I've started with butterfly bush, wygelia, and spirea. I want annuals and perennials to fill in. I want to add in. Is it Cleome? Cleome. Mm -hmm. Um. I. Catmint, so do you have any other ideas like catmint? And I will add, David, just because I'm not sure how, I mean, we do whole classes on this topic. We have classes on this topic that are recorded if you, anybody is interested, um, including Carolyn, who asked this question. Um, we have blogs and some videos. If you want to do a deep dive, I can, I can send you that if you'll send me an email, just so I have your email address. Yeah, and I think that's the best way to answer the question because you've got some excellent choices already on your list. Uh, but as Sally's mentioning, 
we have a list of deer resistant plants and it's broken down into annuals, perennials, trees, shrubs, um, and, and each category. But it's really best for you to get hold of that list through, through one of these avenues and just try shopping from there. Well, and Pat Riley's class on deer is really good. I'll add in. Um, thank you. I see your email. Um, her, her class is really good because she talks about like the levels of deer damage um, and what to do if you see more versus less, like what kind of how more than just dealing with the plants. So she gets really in depth. It's great. Um, so I would highly recommend that and I will send it to you, Carolyn. Um, okay. Well, that's all of our questions. Thank you so much, David. Uh, today, as always, um, I, I feel like I just love that we have all of our blooms and people are going to talk about their spring, spring planting. Um, this is not our lot. We have one more plant clinic and then we're going to take a break for the month of May. And next week, David and Andy are going to be together on Tuesday to discuss fertilizers and soil amendments. Um, so that I believe you guys will be doing a QA and a type session for that as well. Um, right. So I was going to mention that question about fertilizers. If you're available, we'll have a chance to go a little more in depth during that uh, webinar. Yeah, there will be much that will be covered much more in depth at that time. Um, so I think that about covers it for announcements for me. Just keep an eye out for those emails or check our website and you can find the information on those upcoming events. Um, and send us an email if you have any questions. If you're on a Zoom webinar for us, if you signed up through Eventbrite, you can hit uh, reply on your confirmation email. That goes directly to me. If you're on Facebook, you can send us a message or call any of our stores regardless. You're welcome to do that. Uh, so David, thank you so much. Do you have anything else you wanna wrap up with? Uh, I'm just gonna repeat something again because I was talking, I've been talking to some of my colleagues and I've had so many people talking about, you know, is it safe to plant now and stuff? It would be really nice. Everybody wants us just to give, give them an answer, you know, a, a, just a clear yes or no answer. But what I was trying to express today is it, it's always, it depends, um, you know, it's specifics on the plants, your location, um, it, all these kind of things that we have to take into consideration. And I, I'm saying this not to complicate it of, or confuse anybody, but it, it really, that kind of knowledge and experience, you know, is very helpful. And so it coming in the garden center, talking to us, sharing ideas and everything. In general, the answer is yes. I mean, the weather looks good. It's beautiful. And that's why I keep saying, if you see it, buy it because you're going to change your mind and then it won't be there. Um, but, but if you have any questions, any hesitation, if any uncertainty, you know, talk with our sales staff because this is what we do. We sell plants. We're, we're passionate about what we do. Um, we we want to make sure that you're successful with what you're you're aiming to do. Yep, definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much, David. Um, for those of you who sent me your information for the deer class, I'll follow up with you. And that concludes the virtual plant clinic for today. David, thanks so much. And everybody, thank you for joining us. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.